Good evening. That was glorious that you're listening to. That was the South African National Anthem. I think it was the Soweto Gospel Choir. That's right. And thank you, DJ Namdi. I'm so happy you could all join us here tonight. Thank you for joining us from, to the program From Prison to President, The Letters of Nelson Mandela, which is a celebration of the life and work of the great Nelson Mandela. I'm Louise Steinman, the curator of the Allowed series for the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, and we're so proud to partner with PEN America, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, and with Live Right, publisher of this collection, The Prison Letters of Nelson Mandela. And tonight's program is uh, one of many that was held throughout the world, including a recent program that PEN America presented at Symphony Space in New York to celebrate the centenary of Nelson Mandela's birth. We've all joined forces tonight for this important commemoration of one of the 20th century's most inspiring historical figures, a determined revolutionary, as he referred to himself, who fought an unwavering struggle for liberation. Um, some of these letters that we'll be reading, that the, that the um, cast will be reading, are emotional. So if people do get emotional, um, yourself included, bear with us, we'll bear with you. Um, they show Mandela in his most vulnerable humanness. And I think at a time when um, separation of families is again in the headlines as an instrument of state control and coercion, these letters, for many reasons, are more timely than ever. All the letters you will hear tonight are from this new Live Right collection, which is available for purchase tonight in the lobby, compliments of the library store. Nelson Mandela was born into the Khosa royal family on July 18, 1918. And I'll quote our former president, Barack Obama, who noted last week when he delivered the Nelson Mandela annual lecture in Johannesburg, quote, there was no reason to believe that a young black boy at this time, in this place, could in any way alter history. Mandela's struggle was particular to his place, his homeland, but he and his movement would come to signify something larger, the possibility of a moral transformation in the conduct of human affairs. We've invited three very distinguished readers tonight. Uh, we're sorry that Colum Twibin was unable to join us. Uh, they are uh, Amanda Gorman, National Youth Poet Laureate, Ashaki Jackson, a social psychologist, poet, and activist, and Michael Datcher, novelist, poet, and literary critic. They join our other two very distinguished visitors, Zamaswazi Dlamini Mandela, granddaughter of Nelson Mandela and Winnie Mand Mandikazela uh, Mandela, and Sam Venter, the, editor's, the collection's editor. And Sam is going to be our MC tonight. We hope that you'll all stay and join us for a post-program uh, reception in the courtyard. Sam and Swati will be signing, um, Zamaswazi, also known as Swati, will be signing books in the lobby. And now please join me in welcoming uh, our distinguished guests to the stage of the Los Angeles Public Library. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to this evening to mark Nelson Mandela's 100 years. When Nelson Mandela started his 27 and a half year prison sentence, he was a father of five, aged 44. When he left, he was a grandfather, age 71. He was arrested on the 5th of August, 1962, and originally charged with leaving the country without a passport and inciting workers to strike. These charges related to two things. One was a failed attempt on his behalf to get the apartheid regime to agree in 1961 to call for a convention on a non-racial constitution for South Africa. When he realized these letters were being ignored, he and the ANC decided to embark on a strike to oppose South Africa's 
withdrawal from the Commonwealth of Nations. The three-day strike ended after two days because of the, the show of force by the apartheid regime. A month later, they decided to embark on the armed struggle. Nelson Mandela then left the country without a passport to garner support throughout Africa and for himself to undergo military training. That was the second charge. He was sentenced on the 7th of November, 1962, to five years in prison. So when the Rivonia trial for sabotage started in 1963, he was already a sentenced prisoner. The 10,052 days started on the 5th of August, 1962. They ended on the 11th of February, 1990. While editing this book, I decided to tell the story of his imprisonment. The very first letter in the book was written the day before he was sentenced to five years in prison, and it was written to Amnesty. Later, they became Amnesty International, and it was a letter to thank the organization for sending an observer to the trial. The very last letter in the book was written on the 11th of February, 1990. We all knew by then that he was going to be released that afternoon, but he was still writing letters. In fact, on that day, he also had a nap. <laughs> and that is why, when he appeared on the balcony of Cape Town City Hall without reading glasses, he had left them behind on the bedside table when he was napping, and he had to borrow some. So hopefully, when you read this book, you will be able to be taken on the journey with him into various cells in four prisons in South Africa that held him through this period, and to live with him as much as possible the experiences that he went through from utter despair and desperation to joy and exhilaration. Something I want to add very briefly before we start is to picture this. A man in his 40s who was a lawyer, who had left his family behind, made a decision on day one of his imprisonment, never ever to let anybody take his dignity away. And he succeeded. One of his colleagues told me several times that in 18 years on Robben Island, he saw him lose his temper only twice. I don't know how many of us in this room can <laughs> remember when we last didn't lose our temper very often. I'd like to begin now by introducing my friend and the granddaughter of Nelson Cholitlatla Mandela and Winnie Madigizela Mandela to the stage. Her name is Zamaswazi Dlamini Mandela. She will read her forward to the book and then two letters written to her mother and her aunt. By the time I was born, my grandfather had already been in prison for 17 years. In a letter to my grandmother, Winnie Madigizela Mandela, shortly after his 62nd birthday, he lists the people that he has received telegrams and cards from, including my Anzinzi, my sister Zazwe, and myself, and the people he's expecting and hoping to hear from. So far, I have not received a single one of the multitude that friends have sent from all over the world, he jokes. Nevertheless, it is very comforting to know that so many friends still think of us after so many years. It's one of many examples in this book that shows how communication from the outside world bolstered him through his 27 years in prison and just how much he yearned for these letters. During his incarceration, my grandfather wrote many hundreds of letters. The selection that appears in this book intimately acquaints readers not only the Nelson Mandela, the political activist and the prisoner, but with Nelson Mandela, the lawyer, the father, the husband, the uncle and friend, and illustrates how his lengthy incarceration, far away from everyday life, impeded him in carrying out these roles. 
it revisits a very dark time in South Africa's history where those caught opposing the apartheid system's government system to oppress an entire race of people endured terrible punishments. Through his letters, he documents the ongoing persecution of my grandmother and provides insight into what it must have been like for his children, Tembi, Mahatu, Magaziwe, Zenani, and Zinzi. To have an absent father they could barely communicate with or to. This I found unbearable. Even until they turned 16, they could not see him. As much as he tried to parent his children from prison, he couldn't. What has particularly affected me, especially as a mother, is witnessing through my grandfather's letters what my mother and my aunt Zinzi went through as children. Often they were left parentless while my grandmother was imprisoned as well, sometimes because of her involvement in anti-apartheid activities, but also for being the wife of one of South Africa's most well-known political prisoners. Most heart-trending is the wistful optimism in many of the letters to my grandmother and his children where my grandfather suggests, perhaps one day we will and one day we shall. That happily ever after never came for my grandparents, my mother, my aunts, and my uncles. The children suffered the most and ultimately the consequences of forfeiting a stable family life for his, for his ideals was a sacrifice that my grandfather just had to make peace with. My grandfather always reminded us that we should never forget our past or where we come from. The, de the democratic society that both my grandparents and so many of their comrades fought so hard for was achieved after a lot of suffering and a lot of lives lost. This book is a reminder that we could easily go back to that place of hatred, but it also shows that personal resilience can overcome unendurable circumstances. From day one in prison, my grandfather resolved that he would not break or waver. Instead, he would insist that he and his fellow prisoners be treated with dignity. In a letter to my grandmother in 1969, he recommends she boosts her spirits by reading psychologist Norman Peale's 1952 bestseller, The Power of Positive Thinking. He writes, I attach no importance to the metaphysical aspects of his arguments, but I consider his views on physical and psychological issues valuable. He makes the basic point that it is not so much the disability one suffers from that matters, but one's attitude towards it. The man who says, I will conquer this illness and live a happy life, is already halfway through to victory. This inspirational outlook sustained my grandfather's unwavering pursuit of justice and an equal society for all South Africans. And it is one thing that I can be, that it is one thing that I believe that I can apply to my own life's challenges. This collection has answered many of the questions that used to baffle me. How did my grandfather survive 27 years in jail? What kept him going? Through his words, you can find the answers. Thank you. Unendurable circumstances. And I think these are no more evident than in letters to your mother and your aunt. He could not see his children, and they were his smallest, only mere toddlers when he went to prison until they were 16. This is a letter that, you, that your grandfather wrote on the 4th of February, 1969, to your mother, Zenani, and your aunt, Zinzi. They were, they were only 10 and 8 years old then. My darlings, the nice letter by Zinzi reached me safely, and I was indeed very glad to know that she is now in standard two. When mommy came to see me last December, she told me that both of you had passed your examinations and that Zeni was now in standard three. I know that Khatu and Maki have also passed. It pleases me very much to see that all my children are doing very well. I hope that you will do even better at the end of the year. 
I was so happy to learn that Zenny can cook chips, <laughs> rice, meat, and many other things. I am looking forward to the day when I will be able to enjoy all that she cooks. Zinzi says her heart is sore because I'm not at home and wants to know when I will come back. I do not know, my darlings, when I will return. You will remember that in the letter I wrote in 1966, I told you that the white judge said I should stay in jail for the rest of my life. It may be long before I come back. It may be soon. Nobody knows when it will, when it will be not even the judge who said I should be kept here. But I am certain that one day I will be back at home to live in happiness with you until the end of my days. Do not worry about me. I am happy, well, and full of strength and hope. The only thing I long is for you, but whenever I feel lonely, I look at your picture, which is always in front of me. Mommy visits me two or three times a year. In addition, I'm allowed to receive and write one letter every month. All these things keep me happy and hopeful with lots and lots of love and a million kisses. Affectionately, Dada. The next letter that Swati is going to read was written on the 23rd of June, 1969, the month after her grandmother was detained for the longest period. She was in and out of prison, but this time it was from the 12th of May until the 14th of September, 1970. She was tried twice and acquitted twice. In the beginning, she could not take a bath for 200 days. Her lawyers had to apply for permission for this to happen. So Swati and I collaborated on a book with Mamwini on called 491 Days about this period that she wrote about in a secret prison journal. It's very difficult to go back to that place for her and her mother and her aunt, but this is a letter that her grandfather wrote them in 1969. My darlings. Once again, our beloved mommy has been arrested, and now she and daddy are away in jail. My heart bleeds as I think of her sitting in some police cell far away from home, perhaps alone, and without anybody to talk to, and with nothing to read. 24 hours of the day longing for her little ones. It may be many months or even years before you see her again. For long, you may live like orphans, you may live like orphans without your own home and parents without the natural love affection and protection mummy used to give you now you will get no birthday or Christmas parties no presents or new dresses no shoes or toys gone are the days when after having a warm bath in the evening you would sit at table with mummy and enjoy her good and simple food gone are the comfortable beds the warm blankets and clean linen she used to provide. She will not be there to arrange for friends to take you to bioscopes, concerts and plays, or to tell you nice stories in the evening, help you read difficult books, and to answer the many questions you would like to ask. She will be unable to give you the help and guidance you need as you grow older and as new problems arise. Perhaps never again will Mommy and Daddy join you in House 8115 Orlando West, the one place in the whole world that is so dear to our hearts. This is not the first time Mommy goes to jail. In October 1958, only four months after our wedding, she was arrested with 2,000 other women when they protested against passes in Johannesburg and spent two weeks in jail. 
Last year she served four days, but now she has gone back again, and I cannot tell you how long she will be away this time. All that I wish you always to bear in mind is that we have a brave and determined mummy who loves her people with all her heart. She gave up pleasure and comfort for a life full of hardship and misery because of the deep love she has for her people and her country. When you become adults and think carefully of the unpleasant experiences mommy has gone through and the stubbornness with which she has held to her beliefs, you will begin to realize the importance of her contribution in the battle for truth and justice and to the extent to which she has sacrificed her own personal interests and happiness. Do not worry, my darlings. We have a lot of friends. They will look after you. And one day, mommy and daddy will return and you will no longer be orphans without a home. Then we will also live peacefully and happily as all normal families do. In the meantime, you must study hard and pass your examinations and behave like good girls. Mummy and I will write you many letters. I hope you got the Christmas card I sent you in December and the letter I wrote both of you on February 4 this year. With lots and lots of love and a million kisses, yours affectionately, Daddy. So, in prison, Nelson Mandela s received several offers of release from various sources. He rejected every one of them. The last one was in February 1985. By 1969, him and his Rivonia colleagues, well, s not all of them, sick him and six others, the only white man convicted in the same trial was Dennis Goldberg, and he was not allowed to be incarcerated in the same prison as black prisoners. So he had to stay in Pretoria. You can imagine there were very few white South Africans who stood up to apartheid, so they, he had not so much company and was treated as if he was a real traitor. They, were, they had been incarcerated on Robben Island for almost five years, and we have a letter in this book which Nelson Mandela wrote in 1969 to the Minister of Justice laying out why he thinks they should be released from prison. And he uses very specific examples from those who fought against Afrikaners, who fought against the British regime and actually killed people and got off their sentences after some time. In South Africa, around the time that they were sentenced in apartheid, you did not get parole. You served your full sentence. So when they were sentenced on the 12th of June 1964 to life imprisonment with hard labor, they knew life was life. They had no idea that they would ever get out of prison, but they kept up the hope. They did not live without a day's hope, and that's what kept them going. In one of his letters to his wife, Nelson Mandela compared hope to a freedom fighter is what a life belt is to a swimmer. And I think we all take hope for granted. This is what they lived on, hope that one day things would change. So I'm going to call Michael Datcher to the stage to read an extract from this letter. April 22nd, 1969, the Minister of Justice, Parliament Buildings, Cape Town. Dear sir, my colleagues have requested me to write and ask you to release us from prison and pending your decision on the matter to accord us the treatment due to political prisoners. At the outset, we wish to point out that in the making of this application, we are not pleading for mercy, but are exercising the inherent right of all people incarcerated for their political beliefs. Prior to our conviction and imprisonment, we are members of well-known political organizations which fought against political and racial persecution 
in which demanded full political rights for the African, colored, and Indian people of this country. We demanded a democratic South Africa free from the evils of color oppression and where all South Africans, regardless of race or belief, would live together in peace and harmony on the basis of equality. All of us, without exception, were convicted and sentenced for political activities which we embarked upon as a part, as part and parcel of our struggle to win for our people the right of self-determination, acknowledged throughout the civilized world as the inalienable birthright of all human beings. These activities were inspired by the desire to resist racial policies and unjust laws which violate the principle of human rights and fundamental freedoms that form the foundation of the democratic government. This government has persistently spurned our aspirations, suppressed our political organizations, and imposed severe restrictions on known activists and field workers. It has caused hardship and disruption of family life by throwing into prison hundreds of otherwise innocent people. Finally, it has instituted a reign of terror unprecedented in the history of the country and closed all channels of constitutional struggle. In such a situation, resort to violence was the inevitable alternative of freedom fighters who had the courage of their convictions. The government regards the prison not as an institution of rehabilitation, but as an instrument of retribution. Not to prepare us to lead a respectable and industrious life when released and to play our role as worthy members of society, but to punish and cripple us so that we should never again have the strength and courage to pursue our ideas. This is our punishment for raising our voices against the tyranny of color. This is the true explanation for the bad treatment we receive in prison, pick and shovel work continuously for the last five years. A wretched diet, denial of essential cultural material, and isolation from the world outside jail. This is the reason why privileges normally available to other prisoners, including those convicted of murder, rape, and crimes involving dishonesty, are withheld from political prisoners. In conclusion, we place on record that the years we have spent on this island have been difficult years. These hardships have at times been the result of official indifference to our problems. Other times they were due to plain persecution. But things have somewhat eased and we hope even better days will come. We trust that when you consider this application you will bear in mind that the ideas that inspire us and the convictions that give, us, that give form and direction to our activities constitute the only solution to the problems of our country and are in accordance with the enlightened conceptions of the human family. Yours faithfully signed in Mandela. As if 1969 could not have got any worse, a telegram came carrying devastating news. Mandela's firstborn child, Madiba Tembegile Tembi, had been killed in a car accident in Cape Town. His wife, Togo, had survived the collision, but his passing left his two little daughters fatherless. Mandela had not yet met his daughter-in-law or his two granddaughters, Nandi and Ndilega. 
he would have to wait until they reach 16, the required visiting age for that privilege. Winnie Mandela was still in prison, and he poured out his sorrow to her and Tembi's mother, his first wife, Evelyn, and many other members of the family. Letters remained the only tool for his remote control parenting, and they were not enough, notwithstanding their unpredictable journey into the outside world. Unable to physically console anyone or to stand at the grave as his son was buried, Mandela had to rely on his comrades for comfort and his own inner strength. Once they were free, Mandela's colleagues were able to relate their own anguish at seeing him wrapped tightly in a brown prison-issued blanket, sitting in his cell alongside his friend, Walter Sisulu. To read this letter about the death of Tembi, please welcome Amanda Gorman, the first ever Youth Poet Laureate of the United States. Special letter to Zami, Winnie Mandela. July 16th, 1969. My darling, this afternoon the commanding officer received the following telegram from attorney Mendel Levin. Please advise Nelson Mandela as Tembekile passed away 13th. Instant results, motor accidents in Cape Town. I find it difficult to believe that I will never see Tembi again. On February 23 this year, he turned 24. I had seen him towards the end of July 1962, a few days after I had returned from a trip abroad. Then he was a lusty lad of 17 that I could never associate with death. He wore one of my trousers, which was a shade too big and long for him. The incident was significant and set me thinking. As you know, he had a lot of clothing, was particular about his dress, and had no reason whatsoever for using my clothes. I was deeply touched for the emotional factors underlying his actions were too obvious. For days thereafter, my mind and feelings were agitated to realize the psychological strains and stresses my absence from home had imposed on the children. I recalled an incident in December 1956 when I was awaiting trial prisoner at the Johannesburg Fort. At the time, Harto was six and lived in Orlando East. Although he well knew that I was in jail, he went over to Orlando West and told Ma that he longed for me. That night, he slept in my bed. But let me return to my meeting with Tembi. He had come to bid me farewell on his way to boarding school. On his arrival, he greeted me very warmly, holding my hand firmly and for some time. Thereafter, we sat down and conversed. Somehow the conversation drifted to his studies and he gave me what I considered in the light of his age at the time to be an interesting appreciation of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, which I very much enjoyed. Throughout this period, I regarded him as a child and I approached him mainly from this angle. But a conversation in July 1962 reminded me I was no longer speaking to a child, but to one who's beginning to have a settled attitude in life. He had suddenly raised himself from a son to a friend. I was indeed a bit sad when we ultimately parted. I could neither accompany him to a bus stop nor see him off at the station for an outlaw, such as I was at the time, must be ready to give up even important parental duties. So it was that my son, no, my friend, stepped out alone to fend for himself in a world where I could only meet him secretly and once in a while. I knew you had bought him clothing and given him some cash, but nevertheless, I emptied my pockets and transferred to him all the copper and silver that a wretched fugitive could afford. During the Ravonia case, he sat behind me one day. I kept looking back, nodding at him, and giving him a broad smile. At the time, it was generally believed that we would certainly be given the extreme penalty and this was clearly written on his face. 
though he nodded back as many times as I did to him, not once did he return the smile. I never dreamt that I would never see him again. That was five years ago. I know what a shadowing blow his death is to you, darling, and I write to give you my deepest sympathy. Though taken away so early in his life, he will rest in peace, for he has done his duty to his parents, brothers, and sisters, and to his relations. We all will miss him. It is a pity that neither you nor I could pay him the last respects that are due from parents to a beloved son who has departed. To lose a mother and the firstborn and to have your life partner incarcerated for an indefinite period and all within a period of 10 months is a burden too heavy for one man to carry even in the best of time. But I do not at all complain, my darling. All I wish you to know is that you are my pride and that you are of a wide family. Never before have I longed for you than at the present moment. It is good to remember that in this day of bitter misfortunes and bitter reverses, the writer P. Joe Showman told the story of an African commander in chief who took his army of magnificent black warriors for a hunt. During the chase, the son of the commander was killed by a lioness, and the commander himself was badly mauled by the beast. The wound was then sterilized with a red hot spear, and the wounded dignitary writhed with pain as the wound was being treated. Later, Showman asked how he felt, and he replied that the invisible wound was more painful than the visible one. I now know what the commander meant. I think of you every moment of the day, tons and tons of love and a million kisses, Mohlope, devotedly, Dalibunga. Besides having a deep vision and commitment for a free South Africa, Nelson Mandela also had the vision of one day passing his LLB exams. He started first in 1943 at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. He didn't last very long, and by 1952, he was asked, please, not to come back. <laughs> he owed them money, he had a young family, and he also was becoming more politically involved. But his determination to get this degree lasted almost his entire imprisonment. He was faced with many challenges. The books didn't arrive on time. The right assignments didn't get to the right people. It was extremely difficult. I'm very happy to say that in 1988, in December, he got a letter from the University of South Africa telling him that he had finally achieved his LLB. And I was fortunate enough to be at his graduation ceremony, even though he wasn't. Him and one other person were there to, were to, to graduate with an LLB. And um, we now have a letter written by the poet and activist, I'm sorry, not written by, the poet and activist Ashaki Jackson is going to read one of the letters he wrote regarding his education in prison. <laughs> to the external registrar, University of London, October 1st, 1969. Dear Sir, I should be pleased if you would kindly credit me with having passed jurisprudence and legal theory and allow me to write the remaining three subjects for part two of the LLB course on two separate occasions, i.e. I should like to write public international law in June 1970 and the remaining two subjects in June 1971. As a prisoner 
who is doing hard labor, I am experiencing considerable difficulty in preparing to write four subjects in one examination, and any concession you might make in this regard will give me a fair chance of showing competent knowledge in each subject I offer. I might add that one of my main problems has been to obtain the latest editions of the recommended textbooks and to consult the reference works, as well as the journals that would enable me to keep abreast of the development of the law in each subject. The total cost of the study material I require for the purposes of preparing for the examinations is, in my circumstances, prohibitive. I could afford such costs only if the remaining course is phased out as indicated above. Yours faithfully, Nelson Mandela. write about political, sorry, prison conditions to anybody at all except for prison officials. We have many such letters which detail what it was really like for him in prison. And Ashaki is going to read extracts from a 22-page letter he wrote to the Commissioner of Prisons in 1969 complaining about these conditions. Attention, General Dupreez. I must draw your attention to the abuse of authority, political persecution, and other irregularities that are being committed by the commanding officer of this prison and members of his staff. Although this letter raises complaints of a personal nature, some of them affect other prisoners as well, and it may Therefore, be necessary to mention certain names by way of illustration of these irregularities. During the past 14 years of my incarceration, I have tried, to the best of my ability, to cooperate with all officials, from the commissioner of prisons to the section warder, as long as that cooperation did not compromise my principles. I have never regarded any man as my superior, either in my life outside or inside prison, and have freely offered this cooperation in the belief that to do so would promote harmonious relations between prisoners and warders and contribute to the general welfare of us all. My respect for human being is based not on the color of a man's skin, nor authority he may wield, but purely on merit. In this country, only white prisoners have the right to sleep in pajamas. Black prisoners here sleep naked with only blankets as a cover. For 13 years, I have slept naked on a cement floor that becomes damp and cold during the rainy season. Although I am physically fit and active, such unhealthy conditions have caused some damage. I need the outfit urgently, and I must request you to allow me to purchase the recommended pajamas at the earliest possible convenience. It is futile to think that any form of persecution will ever change our views. Your government and department have a notorious reputation for their hatred, contempt, and persecution of the black man, especially the African, a hatred and contempt which forms the basic principle of a multiplicity of the country's statuses and cases. It is certainly quite unreasonable for any man to expect our people, to whom we are national heroes, persecuted for striving to win back our country, to forget us in our lifetime at the height of struggle for a free South Africa. Your people are slaughtering mine today and not a century and a half ago. It is present South Africa that is a country of racial oppression, imprisonment without trial, of torture and harsh sentences and the threat of internment camps lies not in the distant past, but in the immediate future. 
How can our people ever forget us when we fight to free them from all these evils? I detest white supremacy and will fight it with every weapon in my hands. Nelson Mandela. Winnie Madigizela Mandela was Zamaswazi's beloved grandmother. She passed away in April. What many of you won't know is that she helped tremendously on this book. Willingly, lovingly, open-heartedly. In providing the annotations and footnotes, we ran up against brick walls all the time. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. Swati arranged for us to sit down with her grandmother at her home in Soweto, and we would have lists and lists and lists of people to ask her about. Some of the, some of the time she said, well, that's not a real name, or I don't know, your grandfather got it wrong. But she had a razor sharp memory at the age of 81. One of the questions I asked her was, when you came to live in Johannesburg in the 1950s, you stayed at a boarding house called The Helping Hand. Where was it? And without missing a beat, she said, 76 Hand Street, Jeppistown. <laughs> Another was, she opened the door in a really big way. There was a letter that I had written to someone called Tkwanini Mia. The, the, the most I could find out was that this was two clan names. We couldn't find out, who, we asked lots of people. So I showed her the letter and she immediately said, oh, that's Duma Nokwe, who was a brilliant lawyer who had to leave the country because of his political involvement. And through that little piece of information, I was able to track down his daughters who could explain who other people were in the letter. And the very sad thing about it as with many of these letters, they don't believe that he ever received it. And he died in exile the very next year. Winnie Mandela was an activist in her own right. She suffered terribly when her husband was in prison. She was in and out of jail herself. She suffered torture. She suffered separation from her children. She suffered reputational damage just about everything, and like her husband, she did not give up hope, and she did not give up on her people. Something I'd like to just add before I welcome Michael back to the stage is that while she came out of prison in 1971, her husband wrote on a couple of occasions to the Minister of Justice begging for her to be allowed either to carry a firearm which you cannot do in South Africa like you can here, or to have police protection. On one occasion, she was woken up in the middle of the night with a man's hands around her neck, and he only stopped trying to strangle her when she cried out. Michael will come back to the stage to read a letter from Nelson Mandela to Winnie Mandela written in 1970. To Winnie Mandela, August 1st, 1970. Dade Uwetu, can it be that you did not receive my letter of July 1st? How can I explain your strange silence at a time when contact between us has become so vital? The crop of miseries we have harvested from the heartbreaking frustrations of the last 15 months are not likely to fade away easily from the mind. I feel as if I've been soaked in gall, every part of me, my flesh, bloodstream, bone, and soul, so bitter am I to be completely powerless to help you in the rough and fierce ordeals you are going through. What 
a world of difference to you, to your failing health, and to your spirit, darling, to my own anxiety and the strain that I cannot shake off if only we could meet. If I could be on your side and squeeze you, or if I could but catch a glimpse of your outline through the thick wire netting that would inevitably separate us. Physical suffering is nothing compared to the trampling down of those tender bonds of affection that form the basis of the institution of marriage and the family that unite man and wife. This is a frightful moment in our life. It is a moment of challenge to cherished belief, putting resolutions to a severe, a severe test. But as long as I still enjoy the privilege of communicating with you, even though it may only exist in form for me and until it is expressly taken away, the records will bear witness to the fact that I tried hard and earnestly to reach you by writing every month. I owe you this duty, and nothing will distract me from it. In spite of all that has happened, I have throughout the ebb and flow of the tides of fortune in the last 15 months lived in hope and expectation. Sometimes even I even have the belief that this feeling is part and parcel of myself. It seems to be woven into my being. I feel my heart pumping hope steadily to every part of my body, warming my blood and pepping up my spirits. I am convinced that the floods of personal disaster can never drown a determined revolutionary nor can the cumulus of misery that accompanies tragedy suffocate him. To a freedom fighter, hope is what a life belt is to a swimmer. Guarantee that one will keep afloat and free from danger. By the way, the other day I dreamt of you convulsing your entire body with a graceful Hawaiian dance at the BMSC. I stood at one end of the famous hall with arms outstretched, ready to embrace you as you whirled and towards, whirled towards me with the enchanting uh, smile that I missed so desperately. The dream for me was a glorious moment. If I must dream in my sleep, please, Hawaii for me. <laughs> I like to see you merry and full of life. Keep well, my darling. Do not allow yourself to be run down by illness or longing for the children. Fight with all your strength. My fist is firm. Tons and tons of love and a million kisses. Devotedly, Dalibunga. Please welcome back Zama Swazi to read another letter to her mother, written on the 1st of March, 1971. My darling, Friday the 5th February this year was your 12th birthday, and in January I sent you a card containing my congratulations and good wishes. Did you get it? Again, I say many happy returns. I still remember clearly the night when you were born in 1959. Your birth was a great relief to us. Only three months before this, mommy had spent 15 days in jail under circumstances that were dangerous for a person in her condition. We did not know what harm might have been done to you and to her health. And we were happy indeed to be blessed with a healthy and lovely daughter. Do you understand that you were nearly born in prison? Not many people have had your experience of having been in jail before they were born. You were only 25 months old when I left home. 
And though I met you frequently thereafter until January 1962 when I left the country for a short period, we never lived together again. You will probably not remember an incident that moved me very much at the time and about which I never liked to think. Towards the end of 1961, you were brought to the house of a friend and I was already waiting when you came. I was wearing no jacket or hat. I took you into my arms and for about 10 minutes, we hugged and kissed and talked. Then suddenly you seemed to have remembered something. You pushed me aside and started searching the room. In a corner you found the rest of my clothing. After collecting it, you gave it to me and asked me to go home. You held my hand for quite some time, pulling desperately and begging me to return. It was a difficult moment for both of us. You felt I had deserted you and mommy, and your request was a reasonable one. It was similar to note that you added to mommy's letter of the 3rd, January, 3rd December 1965, where you said, will you come home next year? My mother will fetch you with her car. The word expression that I saw in your face haunted me for many months thereafter. Luckily, however soon you cooled down and we parted peacefully, but for days I was lost in thought, wondering how I could show you that I had not failed you and the family. I saw the note that you wrote at the back of the letter asking the postman to send the letter away at once and to be, and to be like Elvis, go man go. <laughs> the music of Elvis is very lively and popular and I'm glad to note that you're fond of it too. I hope that you also love the music of Miriam Makeba, yeah. Mshaupe, Kaluza, Kamaje, Paul Robson, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky. What is even more important, I trust that one day you'll be able to compose, sing, and play your own music. Or do you prefer to be a ballet star in addition to being a scientist, doctor, or lawyer? What games do you play? Basketball, swimming, athletics? especially track events, i.e. running, would keep you healthy and strong and give you the pleasure of helping your college win victories. Try your luck, my darling. May this letter bring you the same joy and happiness that yours gave me. Lots of love and plenty of kisses. Yours affectionately, Data. Some of the letters in this book were taken from a collection called the Donald Card Collection, housed at the Nelson Mandela Foundation. In 1971, three of the books, hardcover books that Nelson Mandela used to transcribe his letters in case the censors didn't send them or made him rewrite them. He had, ex he had the originals to work off they mysteriously disappeared. And in 2004, Donald Card, who had since become a mayor of a city and then retired, contacted the Nelson Mandela Foundation and he said he would like to return these books to Nelson Mandela. There was a ceremony and both were present. Nelson Mandela then handed them to the foundation for their archives. Donald Card does not like to say that he stole these he does not like us to say that he stole these, these letters. However, he certainly was in possession of stolen material. <laughs> I would like to welcome back to the stage to read a letter about this disappearance, Amanda Gorman. To the commanding officer, Robin Island, April 4th, 1971. Attention, Lieutenant Badenhorst. Further to my letter addressed to you on the 31st of March, 1971, I have to advise that yesterday morning I became aware for the first time that two of my full scap hardcover notebooks in which I keep copies of my correspondence had been surreptitiously removed from my cell. 
I immediately reported the matter to the head, Warder Christens, and the presence of Warder Meyer. They both emphatically denied that they had searched my cell the previous day and removed the missing notebooks. They further added that they had no information whatsoever as to the identity of the person who removed the books. On the night of the 31st, March, I decided to make a thorough search of my cell to find out what other articles, if any, were missing. And I was greatly shocked to observe that my silver Parker T ballpoint pen had also disappeared. I had last used it in December 1970, but I continued to see it in the box where I kept it until just the other day. In the morning of the 1st April, I reported the fact to Warder Meyer. I strongly suspect that the person who removed the books from the cell also took the pen, and I ask you to investigate the matter and have this article replaced. The disappearance of my pen has greatly disturbed me. Mine is the fifth to disappear within the first three months of this year. I have lived in the single cell section for seven years, and this is the first time for us to suffer such losses. I should also be pleased if you would kindly give me the following information. One, the name of the official, if known to you, who removed the notebooks from my cell. Two, the reason or reasons for removing them. Three, the date when they will be returned to me. I might add that one of the notebooks contains the completed drafts of two of the three letters which I intend to write for this month. The removal of this particular book means that I'll have to delay the dispatch of the aforementioned letter until I have accessed it. Nelson Mandela, 466-4. It was some years before Nelson Mandela was allowed to write to non-family members, i.e. his many friends outside. On this trip to the United States, we've often been asked about the type of friends he had, and some people expressed surprise that he had Muslim friends. But he had Muslim friends, Christian friends, Jewish friends, Hindu friends, English friends, Afrikaans-speaking friends. In fact, he and these friends were building a society where there would be non-racialism and non-sexism. However, the apartheid regime stepped in and made sure that that was delayed for many decades. Where he was being held in prison, he had Muslim friends, Hindu friends, Christian friends, atheist friends. Unfortunately, he could not have his Jewish friends or Afrikaans friends with him because they were in other prisons being white. One of his very close friends was Professor Fatima Mir, a sociologist. Her husband, Ismail Mir, was a law student friend of his from Witz University in the 1940s. Please welcome back Ashaki to read this letter. To Fatima Mir, friend and comrade. My dear Fatima, this letter should have gone to either Shamim, Shanaz, or Rashid. To hear directly from them would give me a deeper insight into the shifts in the patterns of thought and outlook amongst the young folk. My son Hatu, one of my best pals, visits me twice yearly. We seem to be in agreement on major issues, but now and again he clears the cobwebs from my mind by taking a different view on matters which I have come to regard as axiomatic. At times I have suspected that he sees in me something of a useful relic from the past, a sort of souvenir to remind him of the days when he regarded me as knowing everything under the sun and when he gulped down anything I told him. His independence of mind and fresh ideas have made my conversations with him enjoyable, and this is what I believe that I would get if I spoke directly to the children. 
I have lived with my generation all these years, a generation that is inclined to be conservative and to lean backwards most of the time. I'm keen to know a bit more about the new ideas stirring among the modern youth. There comes a stage in their lives when they consider it permissible to be egotistic and to brag to the public at large about their unique achievements. What a sweet euphemism for self-praise the English language has evolved. Autobiography, they choose to call it, where the shortcomings of others are frequently exploited to highlight the praiseworthy accomplishments of the author. <laughs> I am doubtful if I will ever sit down to sketch my background. I have neither the achievements of which I could boast, nor the skill to do it. If I lived on Cain's spirit every day of my life, I still would not have had the courage to attempt it. I sometimes believe that through me, creation intended to give the world the example of a mediocre man in the proper sense of the term. Nothing could tempt me to advertise myself. Had I been in a position to write an autobiography, its publication would have been delayed until our bones had been laid. And perhaps I might have dropped hints not compatible with my vow. The dead have no worries. And if the truth and nothing but the whole truth about them emerged, the image I have helped to maintain through my perpetual silence was ruined. That would be the affair of posterity, not ours. With all my love to you, Ismail, and kids, very sincerely, Nelson. Nelson Mandela often said that although he had some unsettling dreams in prison, he did not have nightmares. He dreamt, he remembered many of his dreams, and mostly they were about his wife, as we heard earlier, dancing, and meeting up, coming home, finding the family at home, and everything was different. We all know what that's like when we're dreaming of something that we just can never get back. So I would like to call Michael back to the stage to read a letter to Winnie Mandela. To Winnie Mandela, April 26, 1981. My darling mum, I continue to dream some pleasant, others not. On the eve of Good Friday, you and I were in a cottage on the top of a hill overlooking, overlooking a deep valley and with a big river crossing the edge of a forest. I saw you walk down the slope of the hill, not as erect in your bearing as you usually are, and with your footsteps less confident, all the time your head was down, apparently searching for something a few paces from your feet. You crossed the river and carried away all of my love, leaving me rather empty and uneasy. I watched closely as you wandered aimlessly in that forest, keeping close to the riverbank. Immediately, you, as you wandered aimlessly in that forest, keeping close to that bank, immediately above you, there was a couple which presented a striking uh, contrast. They were obviously in love and concentrating on themselves. The whole universe seemed to be on that spot. My concern for your safety and pure longing for you drove me down the hill to welcome you back as you recrossed the river on your way back to the cottage. The prospect of joining you in the open air in such beautiful surroundings evoked fond memories and I look forward to holding your hand into a passionate kiss, to a passionate kiss. But to my disappointment, I lost you in the ravines that cut deep into the valley, and I only met you again when I returned to the cottage. This, this time, the place was full of colleagues who deprived us of the privacy, privacy I so wanted to sort out so many things. 
In the last scene, you were stretched out on the floor in a corner, sleeping out depression, boredom, and fatigue. I knelt down to cover the exposed parts of your body with a blanket. Whenever I have such dreams, I often wake up feeling anxious and much concerned, but I immediately become relieved when I discover that it was all but a dream. Devotedly, Madiba, I love you. Thank you. Nine years after that last letter was written, on the 11th of February, 1990, Nelson Mandela was released from Victor Fister prison at 4.22 p.m. He addressed a crowd from the balcony of the City Hall in Cape Town and spent the night at the official residence of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. As President Barack Obama pointed out in his speech in South Africa last week, and when he got out of prison, he extended a hand to those who had jailed him because he knew they had to be a part of the democratic South Africa he wanted to build. To make peace with an enemy, he wrote, one must work with that enemy, and that enemy becomes one's partner. Nelson Mandela's job was to bring democracy and reconciliation to South Africa, and one of the bodies he set up was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I would like to welcome tonight in the audience Linda Beale, the mother of Amy Beale, who was killed in South Africa 25 years ago. She embraced reconciliation that Madiba had designed, and she is used as an example throughout South Africa for her forgiveness and her humanity. So can we give her a round of applause? Thank you all for coming so much tonight and to share in the celebration on behalf of Allowed at the, li the Allowed team at the Library Foundation and PEN America. Thank you all for sharing this evening with us. Thank you to all our fine readers tonight. Please stay in your seats for a very short closing video clip so that we can hear Nelson Mandela in his own voice talking about why it is important that humanity values each other as brothers and sisters. Thank you. Then N G U M N T U Umto Ngo Umto this Ngo is mm -hmm. a person is a person Gabanya Abantu because of other people. Mm -hmm. You see? What does that mean to you? This means that uh, you can be nothing. If you do not live in society, if you don't get the support of others, mm -hmm. uh, if you are a president, you are a president because your people have put in you in that position. You must never forget that. Because if you lose that support, you will never be president. You are a human being because other human beings want you to play that role of being a human being. Mm -hmm. If they don't want you to play that role, you will never be able to play it. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. Umtung, umtung, gabanyi. Mm 